review body of the 9th of September 2015. I can confirm that the meeting has been properly installed and the report out. Can I please ask members to nominate a chairman for the meeting? Councillor Marsden, thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody along to all parties along to the meeting. Confirm, we confirm the sediment and ask for any declaration of interest. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, five members present. No apologies. And could just remind, uh, remind everyone that this meeting may be recorded and subsequently made available to the public for listening purposes. Thank you. Clear. Can you take the review body through the documents and papers for the meeting? Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that there are two notices of review for consideration at this meeting. First thing, item four, land adjoining Cozy Cottage, Bar Kukufri, refusal of planning permission and principles for erection of dwelling house, 14CC0462. Of the index upon consent, that the notice of review, support and handling, observations of the appointed officer, planning application form, decision notice, relevant extracts, the local development plan and proposed operating application site hotel. The grounds of refusal are on page 46. Uh, one, the proposal is contrary to policy H2 of the local development plan and the accompanying supplementary guidance on housing development in this trilogy, in that the proposed dwelling house would extend an existing ribbon of development leading to inappropriate linear extension along the edge of the village and incremental development along a roadside with no natural topographical finishing point. The requested method of determination is on page 8 of your papers. The applicant has requested that this review be dealt with on the basis of an assessment of the review documents only and also by means of an inspection of the land subject to review. The grounds stated in the notice of review are in summary. One, the application site has a planning history as implemented use as the method of garden ground immediately to the south of the applicant's dwelling house, Cookie Cottage. The proposed use accords with the statutory local plan as designated housing land. If the site was already designated as housing land, house plan development on it be inappropriate. And two, the parish meeting is simply made of senior council and no objections to the proposal. Three, only one dwelling house is proposed, so would, so would not extend an existing ribbon of the development leading to inappropriate linear extension as provided in the stated reason for refusal. To have further, interested, further comments by interested parties, the comments of the road planning team leader and the comments of the appointed officer, we also have all the relevant development plan policies being Constitution shall the local development plan OP1, OP2, HD, NE2, NE4, IN9, and the serial considerations also include supplementary guidance, housing development facility. So, the main issues that the local review body may wish to consider are does the, propose, does, does the proposal conform with the relevant development plan policies? as contained in the Completion Gallery Local Development Plan, particularly Policy H2, Adopted Supplementary Guidance on Housing Development in Villages. And if not, are there any material considerations which indicate that planning permission should be granted to the contrary? These would include consideration of how much weight to give to considerations in presenting status of the site from the previous local plan and the planning history of the site. So, having outlined the documents within the member's papers, it now falls to the LRB to, to determine whether it has sufficient information to consider the review. 
Okay, it's confirmed that new reps can choose them from any part of the catalog chain. The LRB has the following options for this case and the one that follows. You can decide on sufficient information before it to enable it to determine the review today. Request further information in the form of written representation. The LRB will have to be required to state precisely the information it is seeking, who would provide it. Resolve to propose a hearing, again specifying who would be invited to speak and on what matters. Resolve to propose a site list visit, accompanied or unaccompanied, which can be done in conjunction with any of the above, but is not allowed a decision to be made today. And if the local review body resolves it has sufficient information and that no further procedure is required, then it has the full powers to uphold, reverse, or vary a determination. This decision notice will include a statement of the terms in which the planning authority has decided to place review. The planning advisor is present at the meeting. He is here to insist on both items. It is confirmed he has not had any involvement in either case and was not the case officer or the appointed officer for either application. He is here purely to provide independent advice as needed on matters of planning policy, law or process to the local review body. So as members are clear and no further clarification is required, I will ask now Mr Chairman now to lead the debate and in the first instance to lead the local review body through the agenda papers together to decide if it has sufficient information to make the determination today. Thanks Claire. Uh, go on to item four is the, it's the Cozy Cottage Board Kirkcubri. We've got a first part number one the notice of review dated third of March. Have any members got any queries or points of clarification on that? Can we get a bit of clarity, sir? Is the applicant saying wish the review to be done round one, round four? Is that not mutually exclusive? Should it not be either ground one or ground four? Robert? Ch Ch Chair, I'm happy to uh, advise that um, they can choose a combination of, of options. It does say um, if option one, no further procedure is selected, no other option should be ticked. Um, so I read that as really being on the basis of the written submissions and they also mean to have an inspection of the land which is subject of the review. So if, if you like, it should really have been boxes two and four, they would have ticked in the form. But we've accepted it regardless. Alistair. Thank, thank, thanks very much, sir. With your leave then, I take it that you're dealing with it on the basis of what the ticking of box one. Yes, that would be correct, unless you're minded to carry out an inspection of the site as the review body, which is an option open to you. Have we got any other queries on that part? No. Have we got any other decision? Uh, Court on handling. Alistair. Kind of clarification, Chair. If you, if you look at the, the uh, site plan, for lack of a better terms, on page 13, 244, site is obviously S25. Uh, uh, down at the end of that road, you've got what is the village hall. Can you explain to me, Chair, can Robert explain to me? Why is that being regarded as a linear development when it could be possibly argued that uh, it's ultimately an infill site? Can I have some clarification on that point? I think that's helpful. Clarification. Okay, th thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm happy to clarify the plan on page. 13 is obviously an extract from the finalised stewardship local plan 
That was adopted in 2006, so that was an adopted local plan. Uh, and site allocation, ST5, as it appears on the western side of that road, is it contains the application site looking at the northern part of ST5 is now occupied by Cozy Cottage itself. The lower half, the southern half, if you like, of ST5 is the area of garden ground. That's the subject of this review. Now, as you say, Borg's got an identified settlement edge and various allocations within it. So you've got the village hall um, at the kind of junction there, if you like, the main junction, crossroads, arrangement and, and Borg. And if you come south, you've got a form of linear development on that side of the road. There's a gap between the edge of ST5 and the larger property, which is Catherine Bank, located some way to the south. And you've got a big striped 43 designation. That's the old general policy 43, which was an area of local environmental importance. I'm assuming in this case it's partly to preserve uh, the, the setting of the church, which is quite prominent and iconic building in Borg. Um, but in terms of how is it ribbon development, it's simply looking at the pattern of existing development as you traverse from north to south. So you've got a series of buildings as it stands on that side of the road. Cozy Cottage is in the northern part of ST5. The application site is the southern part of ST5. In terms of the present LDP, which replaced the Stewartry local plan and other local plans in September last year, Borg doesn't have a settlement boundary, so it's not an allocated housing site now. And it's looking at a different policy. The key policy now is policy H2 which requires regard to be had for the kind of character and pattern of development, whether or not it would add to or extend the ribbon of development. They're, they're basically, basically adding a, an extra house, if you like, to the site of an existing linear grouping, but there's an obvious gap to Catherine Bank. And as far as I'm aware, there's not really anything defensible in between Catherine Bank and the edge of this site. I should also add on the other side of the road, the site that was allocated under the ST Seven, which had no housing built on it, no permissions, as I understand. And the same goes for the 43 area just to the south of that. If it's helpful to members, I've got a slide presentation that I can show, which shows the context of the site and its surroundings. That would probably be better for okay. members that can come to the Okay, I'm well, happy to do that, Chair. The first photograph is looking south. This is along the access road you can see. In the best plan is probably either page 13, the one you've just referred to, or the submitted location plan on page 41. So you, you've got that property. It stands slightly apart from the cluster of houses that exist at Borg at the moment. Um, the review site is on the right-hand side. It's just out with camera shot here, but we'll come on to that. That's panning round. That's looking towards Borg Parish Church up at the higher level. So again, quite prominent building, uh, significant locally. You're looking at Cozy Cottage is the building you can see, which is a fairly prominent gable, single-storey property with the polytunnel in front. The area where the polytunnel located is the garden area present with Cozy Cottage. They did extend their garden area and got permission for that, and that's again in the papers. It's occupied by a polytunnel at the moment, and that's just a closer view. It shows the development there. This is the review site, and again, you've got the church in the background at the higher level, Cozy Cottage on the right hand side. The next view is probably more relevant in the sense it shows the context for the development in terms of the built pattern of housing and other buildings you've got within Borg. So, this is looking northwards towards the main junction within Borg, where the old post office used to be, and you can see the kind of fairly linear grouping of housing on the left hand side. It's just a kind of single row of buildings, really. On the right-hand side, you've got that building that really kind of sits itself, if you like. There's nothing really further south than that at all. It's just kind of open land to the right-hand side, as you can see here. A few trees and things, but you know, primarily agricultural land, open agricultural land on the eastern side of that road. Yeah, members, Jim. Chair. The building on the right hand side of the road is that the hall? Yes. 
here and know that the hall would be on the left hand side. If you look at the location plan on page 13, the village hall and Borg sits right close to the junction. So in this view, it's in the far distance on the left hand side. You can't really see it clearly here. You can get a sense that the cottage at the end there, you can see the chimney on it. Just to the left of that access, you can see a gable uh, yep. coming up above it. I think I'm fairly sure that's the hall building. The one on the right hand side, I think, is a house. And it, it just sits itself. Again, you can see it on the plan on page 13. It's that building which then accesses on the B77. Right, yeah. It's, it's my reading of the map, I'm afraid. Yes, I see the hall now. Uh, the point I wanted to make, this road which you see here, it is a cul-de-sac, is that correct? Yes, Chair, yeah, just for clarification, yes, that's right. And it ends at Catherine Bank. Yes. Yes. So this is certainly not a through road. Thank you. Any other member? Gordon Hanlon. No. Page twenty-seven. The observations of the appointed officer. First, any point of clarification? No. Nope. Page 31, uh, plan and application form. Sorry, decision letter from Dumfries and Galloway Council, page 43 onwards. Alistair. Sorry, Chair. Aye, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. Aye. Uh, the, the issue is, as I've already alluded to, sir, you know, there's the village hall uh, further down, down that track, for want of a better term. Can that be deemed to be a sufficient topographical feature to say, in fact, that there'll be a, a, a natural endpoint for, for, for any future such development? That's the issue which uh, is presented to you by me. I mean, looking at the pattern of development you've got on page 41 of the papers, you've, just for clarification, you've got two dark, sort of roughly square shaped pieces identified there, just for avoidance of doubt. The top one of those is now the site of Cozy Cottage in the garden. The lower one is the review site, which is part of the extended garden of Cozy Cottage. So there's quite a distance in between Cozy Cottage at the moment and Catherine Bank and its garden area at the bottom. I think if you're looking at development in between where Cozy Cottage is and up to the boundary of Catherine Bank at the moment, you could regard that as infill development in the sense there's an end stop there at Catherine Bank. Uh, the difficulty is at the moment, obviously, it's an application for a single house and there isn't, as I understand it, any real defensible feature there that would kind of, if you like, contain um, the pattern of development um, what it is at the moment. So, looking ahead, if you repeated this pattern, then eventually you would get to Catherine Bank, and that would seem a reasonable, defensible boundary. It's just that that that's not the situation that's there at the moment, if you like. Thank you, Chair. Any other members? Anyone? Uh, 
relevant extracts from the local Dumfries and Galloway Council plan, page 49 onwards. Members, anything on that? Number four is the photos of the plan. Them up on the, on the screen. Is there any members, any other thing in the photos? That concludes the going through. What's that? The, 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 the issue, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for the Maybe indicated on several occasions, but you know, is this uh, linear development with a driven development the fashion that I would want to understand it, or does the existence of Castle Bank, you know, give a clearly defensible topographical feature which would justify us, notwithstanding the terms of the report, saying, well, actually, this is the, the, the infill site situation. Would, would automatically result any further, you know, what, 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 any, if any future applications were, were made, and were brought, as it were, to the boundary of, of, of that feature, that, that inevitably would, would uh, say would, would stop any further development, which would genuinely be, be a linear or ribbon development of the site that I understand. It. That, that, that's my issue to you, and I would be interested, you know, to hear the views of yourself and, and other colleagues. That, that, that's the point that, that issue as far as I'm concerned. David. Hi, thanks, Chair. I can see where all this is coming from. This, this is something that over the years we've had uh, great concern and a lot of discussion about how you round sites off, etc., etc. And I think uh, in all probability uh, there, there is already been said there's no identifiable boundary between Cozy Cottage and the house at the end of the at the end of the road. And to class that as an infill site, you're probably going to build only a half dozen houses. That would be a rough guess. But you're going to put certainly more than one house along that road. And I think it would be totally out of character for that area. And the round, rounding off, I think the examples of infill sites and rounding off page 661 of the LDP show exactly how it should work. And I don't think the, this application fits in with what's on the, the LDP. That, that's, that's my view of rounding off the site. Jim? Here. The difficulty I have with this one is the inclusion of Cantrin Bank as part of the village. Had the village boundary been drawn straight across where Cozy Cottage is, it would be much easier to see that this is ribbon development. But the fact that Cantrin Bank has been included, in effect what you have is development along a cul-de-sac within the boundary of the village, not actually on the edge of the village at all. And that makes it quite a difficult uh, issue to resolve. That the, you know, had someone come along with a proposal for six or seven houses, 
they may well have been successful with their proposal. But because this is incremental development, it, uh, it, it becomes harder to solve. Thanks, Jim. Alistair? Thanks, Chair. Jim's made the point I'm going to make, but um, I buy the argument here that uh, there's no defensible boundary from this, uh, 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 this, with this application. As, as I said, half a dozen houses had been moved, extending all the way to that point. That's not what was before us. I think that's my problem as well. Like Scotland Bank hadn't been there. <laughs> He would have been there, as I say. Have any idea what the distance is between the houses? How could we get in there? I, I, don't, I don't know the exact distance figure. I mean, I'm guessing it's in the region of about 150 metres or so, thereabouts. And again, it depends how large the pots would be. But I, th I, think, I think I've been looking at some of the distance. What Posey Cottage, the size of house, and so on. If that was there, we were probably looking at potentially five or six miles. So, like in between that and Grange and Scotland Bank. Alistair? I, I think another aspect, and I appreciate sort of the, 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 the all of us have been kind of speculative, but if you, you're talking, and I do take the point that my colleague has made, that, you know, but if you're talking about another five or six thousand being moved, that fact, and I used the term quite deliberately earlier on, that fact simply of everything that was done. Maybe if you wanted to remove any such application, you might have to take maybe more than that. Old context. But as I say, um, you know, he's quite right, sir. You know, you've got to deal with what's been proposed today. It, it's arguable as the point I'm making. I think when you see the example on page six here, the thing that you say on the appropriate edge of village site, as I say, containing an established boundary, well, so to me, it's where the Scotland Bank is, but the boundary of Posey's Posey Cottage. Yep. I just asked a question. David. Would Scotland Bank be a farmhouse at one time? And the farmland round about has been sold off to other people, and hence sitting in uh, isolation. Would you? I'm not sure, quite honestly. I mean, the history of it would be agricultural somehow, but whether it was a farmhouse or farm workers' cottages that have been joined together, I'm not sure. I mean, it's more of the kind of scale you would get for farm workers' cottages. Looking at it, then, you know, the typical two story farmhouse of the same age. But uh, it'll be one or the other, that's for sure. Uh, in my opinion, I would, as I say, if you're going in there, try and prove this application due to the fact that it's moved away from the Scotland Bank. And other members. David? No, I w I w I'm afraid that I would uh, move upholding the uh, officer's decision there on the grounds that it's uh, extending river urban development further uh, and cause through proposal cause through the extension of garden grounds. And uh, I'd have concerns about building on that site. It could lead to other things, but that, that's no part of the decision today. It's just what the region is doing. But I would, I would uh, go with the officer's recommendation. Uh, member, Alistair? I think uh, it's a good idea. Alistair, I'm Jim. <laughs> Jim. Uh, chair. I think I would be allowed to, I would be prepared to allow this one on the basis that it is incremental development and there has been no objection from the roads officer. I think further development would certainly raise issues of the road. But I, I, I think I would be inclined to let this one go. Well, can we get an appropriate form of words then for an amendment? That would be, as I say, just like Chair, that would be my one concern would be that road if you're talking about five or six thousand houses. That would be a concern, but we're not dealing with five or six houses and now we're only dealing with this application. 
David. Correct. Could I just suggest that looking at that road, it's not an adopted road. The roads officer wouldn't really have any influence on whatever happens in that road. I, d I don't think that would be a, a, be a relevant argument. Sorry, Jim, but that just uh, reaffirms my point of view. Alistair? Can we have clarification on that point from, from, uh, from, from, from uh, Mr. Oh, Wilson? Um, the Chair, thanks. If it's helpful to the LRB members, the comment that the officer got at the time of the planning application appeared on page 25. Those are from DG First Road Service. It's obviously a new access proposed from an existing private way off the B77 public road. And it says this private way also serves multiple further dwelling houses and the Borg Village Hall. So the way I'm reading that basically is once, I mean, page 41 is probably the best to show this. Once you're south of the junction onto the B727, I think it's all private way after that. Um, but what's clear is from the recommendation was that no objection subject to the imposition of a condition. It's a fairly standard condition requiring relevant number of parking spaces in a turning area so a vehicle can enter and leave the site in forward gear. So as it stands, the roads planning team leaders got no objection to the application of that condition. Alistair? I'll second uh, Councillor McCone's amendment. Right, so I'll move that. Support by Councillor McKean, seconded by Councillor Rick, to uphold the officer's decision to change parking space on the park. An amendment proposed by Councillor McComb, seconded by Councillor Kenny, to reverse the decision and approve on the basis of incremental development and taking into account the conditions of the area. So, sir. Jim. I think also the fact that uh, this is not on the edge of the village, it is a cul-de-sac development inside the village boundary. Robert? I don't know if it's helpful just to clarify a point. Um, we've discussed situation with the Stuartry local plan and at that point in time there was a village boundary. It's a map that appears on page 13. In terms of the new LDP that's replaced that, there isn't a settlement boundary for Borg and you're looking at it on the criteria based policy, policy H2. So that as it stands, I mean Borg is obviously a settlement and it's considered under the housing sites and villages policy, policy H2. There isn't a settlement boundary as such for Borg at the moment. And what that means is there isn't a line drawn in the plan that got, in the case of the Stewart's local plan, means you've got to take a, an interpretation of each settlement as it comes forward. I mean, some of the settlements in the new LDP do have settlement boundaries, like St. Anne, Priest, St. Annan, for example. Some of the smaller ones like Borg don't, but nevertheless, they're still villages, and you just really look at those on a case-by-case -case basis according to the criteria and policy H2. I don't know if that helps, Chair. It's just, just to clarify, really, the LDP doesn't contain a settlement boundary for Borg at the moment. Okay. Um, I've just adjusted the wording of the amendment then to reverse the decision and approve on the basis of incremental development and, the, and taking into account the conditions of the roads officer and also um, the location of Patchen Bank and perhaps the site location of cul-de-sac? Yeah. To me, there is a cul-de-sac with a natural boundary of Catherine Bank. Okay. Right. Chairman, motion or amendment? Amendment. Uh, amendment. 
Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Rich. Motion. Amendment is carried. Three votes to two. We're going to item five, Birkshaw Hydro Drive, Hydro Avenue, Moffat, refusal of planning, permission for erection of dwelling house and formation of access, fourteen stroke three stroke four stroke zero four five two. Grounds of refusal are on page 164. The proposed development is contrary to policy 022 of the local development plan in that the proposed dwelling house was introduced with unsatisfactory higher density form of development and that would not relate well to the existing low density character appearance and pattern of the development of the surrounding area. And two, the proposal is contrary to policy 021A of the local development plan in that the proposed dwelling house, by virtue of its layout orientation, elevated siting directly at the rear of such development, results in a significant impact overlooking a loss of physically to the real curtilage of this residential property, adversely affecting its residential amenity and giving rise to unacceptable land use conflicts. We have the request and measures of determination on page 80. The applicant has requested that the review be dealt with on the basis of further written submissions on the basis of one or more hearings. The grounds stated in the notice of, of, of review are in summary that the proposal meets all the requirements of the LDP and the reasons for refusal are not factually justified and represent inconsistent application of planning policy. And the planning report is including any statements made about the application and misrepresent the proposal. And the planning report fails to apply significant aspects of the new local development plan in arriving at the recommendation. Further in comments by interested parties and the comments of those planning team leader and the comments of the appointed officer, we have all the relevant development plan policies. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have the materials consideration being such planning policy and draft supplementary guidance design policy of new development. And also the another material consideration in the state staff such planning So the main issues for the local review body to consider are does the proposal conform to relevant development plan policy and critically does it comply with local development plan policies OP one and OP two, particularly in respect of the impact of the proposal in relation to density, character, appearance, layout and pattern of development of the surrounding area and potential residential amenity impacts to the neighbouring dwelling house. If not, are there any material considerations which indicate that planning permission should be granted to implement this policy? What weight, if any, does the LRB wish to give to the sustainability and economic benefits arising from the proposal and put forward by the applicant's agent and to appeal supporting documents? Reasons for review, page 172. So, again, having a, a line of the documents, the LRB has the same options as previously outlined, and there's no further clarification required in this agenda. Any further clarification, Councillor Clare? If it be, be helpful this time, maybe run through the photos before we start. We'll run through them, Robert. Thanks, Chair. Happy to do so. <coughs> we, we've covered the, 
note about the photograph, and just, just to clarify, <laughs> I've updated the presentation. It's, it's a labeling issue with picture 12 and page 240. So picture two and page 235 shows the same thing, and that's the one that should be relied upon because it's got the correct caption. So if you can discard picture 12 from your papers, that would be ideal. And apologies for the confusion about that issue. Moving to the photographs, this is looking towards the application site from the reader of Burke Shaw. Now, as a reference in the papers, you're probably best relying on the location plan that was submitted with the application on page 145. So you can see how the proposed site is to the rear of Burke Shaw. Uh, and again, in this picture, you can see there's existing woodland cover there beyond the grass area and the banking. That's the front elevation of Berkshaw. So that's looking from Hydro Avenue itself, which is marked in the plan as a private road. So again, you can see it's quite elevated above the level of that access road. This is the route that would always, <coughs> uh, sorry, also serve the application site as well as other properties up the way, including Forest Lodge and Balvenie. That's looking in a southerly direction. Uh, from the proposed access position as it starts climbing up next to Berkshaw, which you can see on the right hand side there. It shows its rear garden area um, and the levels are shown quite clearly here. It's quite stepped up um, as it elevates towards the left hand side, which is where the application site is. Looking southeast from the position of the proposed dwelling house itself. Um, towards the rear of the application site uh, with neighbouring property, Balveni in the background, you can just see it, the stable of it there amidst the trees. And again, that's slightly further on from the, the site itself. And again, it shows up probably best on page 145 as to how the relationship works between the proposed house, Balveni and Berkshire. This is again, it's looking from the application site, it's looking westward towards the rear of Berkshaw, including the open you know, turf uh, area, garden to the rear. Again, this is looking west towards the rear of Berkshaw. Um, so it gives you an idea of how the properties would sit together. The application site where the proposed house would be sited looking north, so there's obviously a backcropping of trees and rising land on the right hand side, so that's towards the, the east of the application site. And this is looking in the opposite direction. It's looking west from the proposed position of the front windows on the dwelling towards the rear of Berkshaw. So it gives you an idea. I, I think in the report and handling that the officers prepared, it referred to as about sort of 20 metres distance. The application site of the proposed house would be sited. You've got the neighbouring property again, Balveni in the background. This is looking in a southerly direction. You've got the rear garden of Berkshaw on the right hand side. And this is the position of the proposed access to the site. And th this is the part where it climbs up just in between the application site and Forest Lodge. And you've now got, again, you've got Balveni, it's shown more clearly here. It's the northern boundary of this application site on the right hand side, uh, showing the driveway which has to serve Balvenie as well. Neighbouring properties, just to give you an idea Forest Lodge, which is to the north of the application site, slightly overexposed this picture, but again, you've got a split level house, quite sloping ground as well, so it gives you an idea of pattern density, the kind of character of these houses. Going further down, this is towards the south, you've got the property called Tumul Tala, I think the pronunciation. <coughs> um, set back, but again, this is one that faces onto Hydro Avenue. And then you've got Sunny Bray, further to the south of Tumul Tala. And again, that's fronting Hydro Avenue. So it gives you an idea of the kind of levels, uh, the sloping nature of the, of the land, the elevated nature of houses in this location. Thanks, Robert. We'll go on to uh, first part, the number one notice of review. Numbers.
David? No, that's where we some of the language that's used in here. Or can we question that, or is that something we've got to accept? If we go to some of these numbers in here, page 80, I think it is, of 244, where it's uh, commenting on the planning reports misleading and misrepresents the proposal. The proposal fully complies with the LVP and there's significant aspects of the LVP that have not been reported on. And there's a number of areas where, if we follow on just in the next two or three pages, are our review appeal and supporting documents. The, where they're um, saying that the uh, planner has not accepted the conditions on the LVP, that they haven't interpreted them properly as far as the uh, person that wrote the report is concerned. Can, would the Robert like to comment on some of these? Well, obviously, when notice of reviews are submitted, they're, they're checked for their content, and any inappropriate language is edited out or anything that's not particularly relevant to the review. Yeah, there's some strong views in there, um, but if that is the view of the person making the review, and it isn't unacceptable to publish on the website. We've got to accept that as a held view so that members have the best information in making the decision. But that's the view of the applicant's agent, and you know they're, they're entitled to hold that view if they want to. It's up to yourself, the board, the review body, to decide whether or not they're minded to agree with some of the statements that are made or not. But yeah, we did we did look at it and consider the language and so on and so forth, um, and it was felt to be, although it was significant disagreement, if you like, with the terms of the report in hand, and felt that the language that was used was, was legitimate. It was obviously the view of the applicant's agent. On that basis, we decided to accept it and publish it. The risk was a bit too much to Do you now remember? No. Well, what? Chair, I should just maybe clarify for the avoidance of doubt the part that's redacted, the reason it's been redacted isn't because of the inappropriate content, if you like, it was because it was relating to a complaint about the officer's handling of the case and we had to take that out because obviously that's not something as a local review body you can take into account. You're here to look at the merits of the application and whether you think it's acceptable or not and review the decision that was taken. So that was the only reason why that was taken out and it was done so with the agent's knowledge and agreement. Thanks. More match. Two, page uh, 93, report my handling. In that. Uh, three observations of the appointed officers, page 103 onwards. There is, is an issue here, sir, which concerns me somewhat. And it's uh, over the last 16 and a bit years, uh, I wish I had a tenor for every time elected members are reminded that uh, you know, they've got to be consistent in the application of their policies. But I've noticed that there's a tendency uh, where, you know, it's been over the last comparatively recent period of time that uh, when officials have been challenged uh, about an alleged inconsistent application of policy, that the response always is, well, you've got to look at each application and its merits. Now, I don't know whether Robert would care to comment on that with your leave or not, sir, but, you know, it seems to me that if uh, it's incumbent upon elected members to be consistent, it's also uh, incumbent, I would suggest, you know, be consistent, be consistent the way they're applying policy. I would also suggest that it's equally incumbent on the person applying it to be likewise. That's uh, always 
disconcerts me somewhat, Jim, uh, when we see the response of, well, okay, but you know, who's got to pay for this kind of thing? As I say, if, it's, if he feels so, that's maybe not worthy of a, a, a response. I'll be guided by you as always. Thank you. Um, the, the, the statement is correct. Each application is obviously considered on its own merits. But officers are working with the same set of policies all the time. So what you're doing in each case is, I mean, policies are words, statements of intentions, if you like, or tests, um, lots of criteria that need to be fulfilled by development. So for each case, the officer is looking at the proposal and trying to envisage whether or not the proposal is going to fit with that policy or not, and if it does fit, where does it, and if it doesn't, where does it not, because it's, it's not as simple as a tick box exercise where you think, right, we've got to comply with all these policies to tick them all off. Sometimes you get, you know, cases where it's not always obvious or there's maybe a slight divergence from what one policy is aiming. E each case is a judgment, but in terms of the standards that are applied, they should be the same in the way, you know, if, if you're looking at character, um, pattern, Density, appearance, presidential amenities. They're, they're normally the same type of considerations in the same question, but not for each case, certainly in my experience. You, you'll get different decisions over time as policies change and so on, but for each case, the officer will be looking at what those policies say and questioning the development and asking, you know, for example, if a, there's two key policies here policies OP1 and OP2, they'll be looking at the exact words of that policy, they're looking at the supplementary guidance terms of work out what the intention is, you know, what the outcome, what the outcome sought is, and does the development comply with that or not. So, yeah, the application of policy by officers should be fairly consistent. And it's observed, it should be commended in good and fine. Thank you, Alan. Is there no other comments on no observations of the appointed officer? Four comments of the applicant's agents, page 107 onwards. Members, and on that page uh, 161, the decision letter from Dumfries and Galloway Council. No questions on that. Page 167, the relevant extracts from the Dumfries and Galloway Local Development Plan. Questions? Any questions on that? Uh, supplementary guidance certainly helps a bit when you're going through it. Got nothing on that. Had the photos. Stand. Now we'll go to the members. Members are quite clear. Everyone's in there. Can we carry on and conclude this, Jim? Thanks, Chair. Just one wee point in relation to the map on page 144, sorry, 145.
immediately south of Birkshaw, there is a small triangular plot shown with a rectangular building in it. Is that a house or is, is it some other building? Uh, Chair, I can't say with certainty, but my recollection is, um, from speaking to the case officer, it was a domestic outbuilding. It's not a residence in itself. Yep. Amos. Thank you, David. All right, Chair, thanks. I think uh, overlooking issue is such that I would certainly support the, the officer's consideration. I think uh, the, g given you're, you're working on uh, set land and th th this uh, proposed development is sitting higher than the house in front of it, Berkshaw's, or any to the side, I think it's overlooking it. The type of development it is, uh, the type of houses, I don't think it would be appropriate to to change the, the officer's view on this at this stage at all. So I would certainly be up for the decision. Alistair? Chair, it, it would be helpful to see the slide again that Robert was here leaves or that Robert previously put up because I think that is still potentially seen as a concerning issue. Robert? What you want, Alistair? It, it, it's the one with the overlooking, sir. I, I was thinking, Chair, that the, the, the earlier one was actually the more compelling of the two. That, that one. Alistair? Chair, uh, I presume it, it, it would be competent. I, I'm not entirely convinced, but I have to say, about the grounds of first, ground, about the grounds of first ground of refusal. I think that's arguable, but I do uh, certainly agree with uh, Councillor McKee uh, in relation to possibly contemplating policy OC1A, uh, given uh, the re-evaluation of the first property question. Uh, would it be acceptable, as it were, to, to strike out the first ground of refusal and, and to continue with the second one, sir? Uh, ch chair is within the gift of members. Uh, with regard to first ground for refusal, it's couched in terms of what's considered to be a lack of compliance with the criteria set out in policy OP2. So if members are minded to take the view that it doesn't actually give rise to those issues, it follows that it's your view that it doesn't, you know, for example, compromise policy OP2. So Stated reason is obviously the proposed ground has been introduced an unsatisfactory higher density form of development that's not really well existing low density character appearing in comparison with development in the surrounding area. So if members are, you know, not minded to take that view, then the first reason for refusal should certainly be struck. You know, if it's your view it doesn't actually discord with policy OP two, then it would be appropriate to do that. Alistair. Th thanks, Chair. I, I would be interested, sir, to hear any views of you or colleagues that may, might wish to make in that. Jim. My view is that the, the first reason for refusal that it would introduce an unsat unsatisfactory higher density form of development, I think that has already happened. I think there are infill plots which certainly have you know, a smaller 
garden than the the original plots. Uh, you is it you bray to the southeast of the proposal. I think you'll find you bray is similar in size to the grounds of the proposal. I think you bray is the 1,090 square metres, the proposal 1,345. Now, I take the point, you bray is maybe about 75 or 80 metres to the southeast. But it, it is an infill plot which certainly has, has increased the density. I, uh, with regard to the second reason for refusal, I think there are genuine grounds for concern with regard to overlooking. I think that confirms with my, pretty much with my line of thinking as well. Like, I didn't think it was going to increase much a higher density or something like that. But when you see it overlooking the plot, uh, that there, like I say, I, say I think it was completely unacceptable. Alistair? Thanks, Chair. I think I'm edging towards the opinions of my colleagues. Um, and I certainly, when I note the agent's comment saying that the design would not, this is on page 111, the, this design would not have been proposed if the current occupants of Birchall felt their privacy would be invaded. Well, they are the applicants after all. So I think I should say, well, they would say that. Um, if they want this application to be successful, uh, they wouldn't say, yeah, we're going to build this house, but we don't want it to protect us and overlook us. I do, then I move to looking at the, the report on page, and specifically on page 98. I was almost veering towards the applicant until I read paragraph 4.6. And it made a, re a very good and comprehensive summary in terms of saying, yes, um, uh, the applicant says that um, other places within, other sites within the locality have the same density as the one he's proposing, but it clearly says that it's the plots located in the southern part of Hydro Avenue and not adjoining plots. So the clincher for me was, uh, well, not quite the clincher, but the fact that um, in the immediate locality of this proposed plot, the density would be current. Whereas the applicant does correctly point out the fact that lower down, um, there is greater, there is more, there is the density is, 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 is more density, but yeah, in the immediate locality, would probably be current. Um, just one wee question, though. Are we entitled to a site visit? And can we ask for a site visit? Robert? Yeah, you can ask for a site visit, I think, Alistair. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to ask for one. Thank you. <laughs> right. David? Based on that matter, I think we agreed that there's sufficient information for us to make a decision for a site visit. Relevant. Still have an option. We agreed that there should be enough information there. Do our members quite agree to, to, to take out the first part one and refuse it on two? I, I would be minded to do so, sir, and we'll make it abundantly clear that it's a, it's a specific proposal and a specific layout which is the issue here. In other words, it's contra uh, policy 021A. Members agree to that? Yep. Get that clear. Yes, thank you, Chairman. We confirm that members have agreed to the variance with the Citizen Affairs Point Dock Church and proceed on the grounds laid out in Reason 2 they found that the proposal is contrary to policy. Thank you. 
Square. That's finished. As I say, I have no further business. Business. Thank everyone for attending this morning. Right, thank you.